Well, what's the crack? How's it going? You're all very welcome to episode 139 of Buckshot for Thursday, I think, the 9th of uh, April. Who, who knows? Who knows? I can't even eat her Easter eggs correctly this weekend. Huh? Jesus Christ, I might. <laughs> I might just go to go to virtual mass just to get just so I can feel right about eating eating Easter eggs. What's the crack? Sorry, I haven't had a ramble pot out this week. I've been I've been busy. <laughs> what can I know? I've actually been outdoors a lot, trying to just. I'll explain it all. I'm going to put out a ramble pot on on uh, Tuesday next, so I'll get it recorded on Sunday or whatever. But I'm just I'm just writing as well, just writing like a bastard because you got to change gears. Stay like if I was continuously indoors in front of that fucking laptop, you know, editing podcasts and all the rest of it. Even though if a fair shot, I'm gone out and all the rest. Of it, you'd go, you'd go mad. You would go mad. And my thanks again. I found out a few people had messaged saying they couldn't click through on the Patreon thing, and they were listening through Spotify. A uh, weirdly, for some reason, Spotify mashes the two links that I have in it to the merch shop and to the Patreon link. When you put them in, they come out normal in iTunes, they come out normal in podcast app, they come out normal in Podbean, Acast, but for some reason, Spotify is short on space in that little box and it mashes the two of them together and they're, what you end up with is this link that's just the two mashed together and it comes up saying, ah, there's no such link. My apologies. There's no real way around it other than getting rid of the merch shop one or if you go to Patreon and look for Tom O'Mahony. If you feel like contributing to the podcast. My thanks very much. You got the early release of Hard Enough Podcast late last night. Which will be out tomorrow. Uh, Friday the 10th. It'll be out tomorrow for you. So we got the, I got that out last night. And that's gone to the Patreons. And that's kind of what I do. You know what I mean? Just to say thanks very much. For the new people that have come on board. Fair fair complete to you. Help, helping, helping the podcast continue. I have a, another Tom and Jerry show will be out for you on Sunday. Just so you can be eating your Easter eggs and what not. So why not have another Tom and Jerry show and then I will have a ramble pot out on Tuesday. I have a couple of guests lined up so we're just te- teeing them up to see what time suits them and all the rest of it. Because surprisingly enough people have made a little work away from home. People are managing to keep busy with things. I'd imagine our houses are fucking immaculate. But it's what you gotta do. Obviously follow me on all the social platforms if you don't normally follow me or if this is your first time listening hit subscribe because there's a fair amount of fucking content coming out and also pop over and look for Harden Up Podcast with Owen Colgan and Tom O'Mahony that one or you'll get them you'll get them if you're on the Patreon regardless of whether you're subscribed or not you'll get them there and on the social platforms is Tom O'Mahony Comedy we'll find you oh, I have some talking about social platforms to talk about when you hear on oh oh I managed to some some cunt managed to get me blocked for a, over something Last night, so oh, oh, I, I have so much to talk about, and we'll do a fair bit of giving out on Tuesday next. But we have a load of deliciousness coming your way. My guest this week is an absolute fucking gentleman of the comedy world, Steve Cummins. Steve, I've him to thank for a lot of things. He he vouched for me because it's tough enough when you're starting out to try and get in to the big clubs, and he vouched for me when it came to. Getting into the Laughter Lounge, which has been a success story ever since. It's been a very happy marriage between myself and the Laughter Lounge. And yeah, things like that. We've given each other gigs, given each other advice back and forth. And he's just one of those fucking brilliant blokes. He could drop him in anywhere and he'd be the life and soul of the party. He's fucking hilarious. He's a brilliant MC and brilliant crack and a fucking savage, savage cook. So enjoy. Sit back. Roll up a fucking joint and enjoy the fantastic Steve Cummins. Steve Cummins, how are you? Thank you very much. All the way from from North County Dublin, out by the seaside. Thank you very much for joining me this morning, brother. Well, I am delighted to be basically staring at another grown-up, which is nice. It is, isn't it? How have you been dealing? I'm lo- I, honestly, and this is going to piss people off. I'm loving it. Genuinely, I'm really having a great time. The only thing I'm missing is gig, right? I set up my own company a few months ago, and I was getting kind of swamped up, kind of weighed down with stuff. There was so much things coming in on top of me to trying to catch up because, like, I spent 15 years working with young offenders all over the world, right? Then the next 15 years, 
doing stand up and all sorts of weird shit like that. And now, for probably now until the next 15 years when I retire, I'm a company director. So the learning curve's huge. I've never done anything like this. So suddenly, this thing happened and everything went, okay, stop. Just relax a minute. You have plenty yeah. of time to do your shit now. So I'm at home. You're, I'm like yourself. I love to cook. I've got a, a house full of nice food. I'm cooking. I'm with everyone I love is all under the one roof. And uh, I've nothing really to stress me. I'm watching TV all the time, scratching my hole, drinking like a fish. It's great. Well, that was the new can of Coke you were drinking there. But I, for a second, I thought you were drinking a can of Coors. For anybody listening, it's 5 to 11 in the morning, which <laughs> in my book is totally acceptable, Steve, if you want to go for it. Christmas Day, you're up first thing in the morning. I remember a few Christmases ago, it's when the kids were smaller. Newell and I decided to get a bottle of champagne for Christmas morning to make mimosas, right? We ended up, I ended up, because I do all the cooking, I ended up putting on the dinner. And then we had this, right? And I had to, we had to go back to sleep off our breakfast for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's at like quarter past eight in the morning. This was years ago. And we've never done it since because, you know, you, 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 your body's not built for that sort of thing. And to polish off a bottle of champagne with orange juice at 8 a.m., I mean, it sets you up beautifully for the day. But we were locked. It was great. I but tried was- to drink this because I cooked this Christmas dinner. The in-laws were down. We were down in Limerick. And I tried to, but because I was, you, you know, when you're on top of your cooking and you've got a ton of things going on, uh, it's drink, which is weird for me, became secondary. It was like, oh. I mean, Well, it's such a big meal. There's no real time. You can grab something and sip on it. But you're next thing you turn around, you go, I haven't had a sip of a drink in 40 minutes because I've been so busy doing so. You know what I mean? When did, where did the cooking come from? Was there a big cook in your house growing up? No, my mother, God rest her. My mother was, was a terrible cook. Her mother before her was a terrible cook. We, I grew up in a single parent family, blah, 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 blah. And I was the responsible one. So I started cooking dinners at around about age 10, 11. But it was like spuds, carrots, throw on some chops, nothing major, right? And that was kind of me. I've always been the one who did cooking, but nothing spectacular. And about seven or eight years ago, maybe a little, about 10 years ago, I started kind of watching Jamie Oliver and stuff like that. And rather than do his recipes, there was a thing called America's Test Kitchen. And it's right. on, uh, it was on PBS. And you know when they high up, just before the porn channels on Sky, PBS yes. is there. And no, it, I mean, no, what? <laughs> so I've heard. But America's Test Kitchen, basically it's genius. They have like 40 cooks, 40 chefs. And what they do is they go, okay, what do we pick? Something as simple like macaroni cheese. And they get their 40 chefs to do it as min- loads of different ways. And then they, they go, this is the best way to do it. And then if you watch, so they really taught you about the mechanics of cooking and how to cook. So I started getting into that. And then I realized that I loved doing it. And there was a reward at the end of it, which was fucking delicious food. So my absolute favorite time, normally I've said it to you a hundred times, my favorite Sunday I'm drinking a few beers. My wife's drinking wine. I'm cooking. She's calling out crossword clues or whatever. And now, because of this COVID, we're doing that pretty much every day. She's still being a grown-up working. But, I mean, I'm just cooking. Like, I've got a shoulder of lamb in there for tomorrow. I'm doing a, I'm doing a ham today. Yesterday was a chili. You know what I mean? Like, and things that you slow cook and take your time over. And, Jesus, we're like, I'm surprised I'm not twice the size. Of it. It's all clean cooking, too, isn't it? Like, you know, see, like you wouldn't be, you not, if it's not that processed shit, you'll be all right. You know what I mean? You may pack on a bit, but a bit of timber, but you'll be all right. Like, but as you say, you pack on a bit of, I love your expressions, right? You're a big bogger. But anyway, you pack on a bit of timber, right? But the thing is, it's good hard wood, Tom. It's none of that. <laughs> you get There's somewhere else. behind it, like, yeah. <laughs> but no, you're right. Because like processed everything, I mean, the, uh, a friend of mine's a, an EMT, paramedic, right? And he's he's kind of into health and all that. And he's been doing, and when he researches something, he properly researches it. And he's basically saying, nothing wrong with fat, all types of fat, you're grand. It's sugar and salt. And even salt isn't as bad as we thought. Sugar is the real killer, right? Yeah. So when you see something low fat, they basically fill it with sugar and salt to try and give it flavor. And da, 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 da. So all this processed stuff, even a tin of peas, processed peas, it's like 25% sugar or something insane. So if you cook it, yeah, it's nuts. Anything that's basically anything because sugar, uh, sugar and salt act as preservatives as well. So you know what I mean? It's all crammed into one thing. So when I cook, like I was looking at the, say the chili I made, I make, I make a huge pot of chili. I use lumps of meat. Like it's not your, uh, it's not just mince or whatever. But I looked, I probably used in the entire huge casserole, I might have used maybe a teaspoon and a half of sugar. In it. Now, if you, just to season it, if you bought a store bought chili, one of the little ones, it would have five or six spoons of sugar in something or spoons of salt 
in something about the size of my hand. Herself was asking me, because I'm popping out to the shops today and we were just making the list. I said, I need more butter. She goes, what? How much butter do we go through? I said, quite a fucking lot. You would not, you'd be surprised how much butter we actually go through. She goes, but then, how, the f- how are we not getting fatter? I said, because it's grass-fed fucking dairy. It's, it's milk, essentially. It's Irish butter and it's fucking really good. Do you know what I mean? The colour of it. I know they use carotene or something to put a little bit of colour. But like, we're blessed. If you look at like, the bog standard Parmesan you buy in Tesco mm. is, would be considered, in America, would be considered high class, super expensive stuff. The regular steaks you buy in Tesco, again, would be mail order steaks in America. Like, we are blessed with the quality of food in this country. The cheap, our cheap food is good quality. Our expensive food is phenomenal. Even I was talking with uh, Gordon Rochford. You remember Gordo? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. He has those conspiracy guys, his podcast, and it's highly successful. But he lives a lot of his life through the eyes of America. You know that kind of way? So he was, I was chatting with him the other day, and he's, you know, he was talking about this, new, this pandemic and this, that, and the other, and he hopes that the, the, the grocery lines and all the rest won't close. I said, man, spuds are still going to come out of the fucking ground. Sheep are still going to be killed. The old man works in the beef industry, and they are gone into overdrive. Yeah, for the, absolutely. Amount of, the amount of killing that's going on at the minute, like because they fucking asked it, because they're what they're doing is they're they're stockpiling, because they realise that things like fucking people's quinoa notions are going to be slowing down in the next fucking month or two, you know the fucking notions are getting all that shit that's coming in from abroad will be will be going back a few a few generations I think so they're stockpiling the, at the minute. All the avocado people are going to be very fucking depressed very soon. Mm-hmm. It is. It's going to be. Like, you're a big meat man, and so am I. Like, to me and you, there is nothing better than taking a large lump of whatever fucking meat you get your hands on and slow cook it, whether it's in a barbecue, whether it's in your oven, and then you've got meat for days. And that's kind of us, you know, meat and potatoes people. And I, I lose all sorts of fancy ingredients and all sorts of fancy herbs. But at the end of the day, if you give me meat and four decent vegetables... I'll make you something delicious regardless. Just give me a bit of salt and pepper. It's going to be good if you've got good ingredients. Because I was trying to think too, because Natasha, she likes to cook, but nothing to the extent I like to cook. And she was asking, what the fuck is it? Because mam now is a very good cook. Now her mother was a terrible cook. <laughs> I was trying to fucking think about what, and I, it's a performance, isn't it? It is. I won't let anybody, like, if anybody moves something in my kitchen, because I'm standing there. And Nuala said it before. She said, sometimes it's like watching a dancer move. Because I know where everything is. And I reach for this and I reach for that. And, and the smell and the taste. And I only read yesterday that one of the symptoms that they're coming out now of, of COVID-19 is lack of taste and smell. That's 56% of people have, have said that. That was one of the first symptoms they got. And I said to the family, I said, lads, you're screwed. Because if I lose my sense of smell and taste, these gorgeous meals that I'm cooking are fucking over. Now, my wife's a good cook as well, so we're all right. But um, yeah, I know what you mean about performance. I love just... You know, is there anything better? If you think about it, just throw in it. And I use herbs by the fistful. Like, I'm not sucking. I've never used a fucking tweezers in my life when I'm cooking. <laughs> this wank. I have a brother-in-law who is a chef. And obviously, what well, he teaches now in, in Killy Bags or something. But he was a chef for years. You know, it's all like, oh, it's this tiny little bit on here and this little bit or whatever. It's like, fuck that. Here, have a spoonful of that. That's amazing. Do you know what I mean? It'll blow the tits off you with flavor. A lot of that, I think, is... You're gussing it up for people who wouldn't fucking know a good fucking yolk if you hit it with them. You know, sometimes people need to see this beautiful fucking ballet come out on a plate. And they go, well, that's amazing. You're going, ah. you know. Now, it may be amazing, but also you should be able to hand them a bowl of the greatest stew in the fucking world. And it looked like whatever, you know, fucking dog food, but still taste stunning. Yeah, really good stew doesn't look that amazing. No, but- Smells fucking great and tastes like Jesus coming in your mouth, but that's about it, you know? <laughs> oh, I've always felt that. Because Jesus, obviously it would taste good, right? He'd warn you, right? There'd be none of this grabbing by the back of the head and forcing. No, I mean, of all people. <laughs> he, he would be sound, I'd imagine, you know. The, com- the coming of the Lord, baby. <laughs> <laughs> ribs this Sunday. I'm doing slow smoked ribs this Sunday. Oh, I have to admit, you know, anytime I see you do anything with ribs, it's like... It's like I'm not saying I'm wanking to it, but I'm not saying I'm not wanking to it. Well, I'm wanking, so I would totally appreciate it. We should do that by Skype, just... <laughs> Time for that special glaze that only... Because <laughs> I have a friend who's actually, would you believe it, allergic to sugar. Allergic to sugar. Oh. Yeah, so she can't have barbecue ribs. How, she was... did, I, how did I know it was a woman? Yeah. <laughs> 
said that to you, I said as a woman, isn't it? And you went, she can't. Well, of course she can't. She no said, man in the history of the world. I guarantee you, if you stack up who's got more allergies, men or women, worldwide, you're going to find an awful lot more women than men with allergies. Do you think so? Yeah. yeah and I yeah, just but... think, I think it's because a man could be allergic to sugar. and go, okay, well, Or see, a man could be allergic to wheat. Not a celiac, but say a bit of the old gluten intolerance. intolerance. Yeah. And it goes, so what happens to you? Well, it makes me fart a lot and my stomach gets a bit bloated. But I do love a fucking slice of bread. Bollocks, I'm eating the bread. Do you know what I mean? Like, unless we swell up like a fucking balloon and drop dead of a heart attack or something, then our no allergy is going to stop a man. Is that why we die sooner? Things, that attitude, like, Ara, fuck it, drive on. Stephen King, you said a great thing once in an interview, and he said, um, if a man finds blood in his stool, he'll shit in the dark for a month. Right? <laughs> what a and thing. it's so true, isn't it? Because he just will ignore it. We'll ignore it. Go, geez, this, this, these chest pains and tingly left arm I've been having for the last week. Jesus, I, do you know what? Must be something I'm eating. Fuck it, I won't drink so much tonight. Do you know what I mean? And we'll just ignore it until we drop dead. That's why men die young. The vast majority of us are fucking cavalier about everything. Uh, so I've come up with a way of, because barbecue sauce, unfortunately, is like 50% fucking brown sugar, as you know, you know, <laughs> like just, yeah. it's, it's very naughty. But I've, I've, I'm going to do an Asian style. With yeah, I'm gonna do satay, the slow smoked satay ribs, with um, peanuts and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turns out she doesn't have an allergy to that. Are you gonna use peanut butter or what? Or are you gonna grind up? Yeah, peanut, peanut butter. butter. Yeah, yeah. Is there sugar in peanut butter? Not the clean stuff. I have a, a tub of the clean stuff. You know the because um, a lot of it's fucking old palm oil and shite like that. But I was able to get it was the old the good the good stuff was at half price and fucking super value. So I went get you a bucket of that. Thank you very much. Yeah, because something like that will last forever as well. Going back, you were originally from Limerick. What part of Limerick are you originally from? My Ras. My Ras. Do you know what I mean? It's actually, yeah, genuinely, we moved. I grew, I was born in Balananti, right? Right. And you know how rough that is, right? Yeah. And then we were, my mum, God lover, was working. Um, she was working in the post room of the tax office. My mum started off opening envelopes in the revenue commissioners. And she ended up, when she retired, the head of PAYE for the whole country. Jeez. And this and this was before marriage promotion or anything else. Initially, it was um, it was long service promotion for years in the revenue. It didn't matter. You could be the greatest fucking gobshite in the world. But if you had been there for 10 years, you were automatically promoted to the next level or whatever, right? So my mother, she had to wait a long time. And then when marriage promotion came in, then she moved a lot quicker. But we grew up. So home alone, my dad uh, just basically didn't exist. Right. Well, I assume there was once there was a once there was a sperm, but otherwise maybe you're right? the new Jesus. You did have well, a long I, had, while. I had the hair for ages. Oh, geez, very quickly off topic. Uh, Sam, my youngest, came in the other day yesterday with one of these face swaps. You know, you can look like a woman or look like a man. Yeah. Right. It clicked me to look like a woman. It looked exactly like I looked for like ten years there. Ten years. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when you met me with the hair? I swear that was all the difference. It clicked to a woman. I was like, that's just me 10 years ago. It smoothed out my wrinkles and let me hair fucking the exact same color. But anyway, um, at age seven, we were home alone, right? Mm. Uh, because my mother had to go in and do some work time because she's no fucking money. On me. Go, this book, right? And we lived in a, one of these, it's like a, a regular house, but uh, it was a flat above and a flat below in Valentine. Do you know what I mean? Like a two up, two down kind of thing, two bedrooms upstairs, two bedrooms. They're known as, the posh people call those duplexes. Yes, well, duplexes. Well, this was basically half a flat, right? But um, I remember we opened. So you come into my, you come in the front door and you go straight up the stairs, and that's where we were upstairs, right? I opened and went straight to the sitting room. The bedrooms on either side. I opened the door and there was a wall of black smoke. Right, the house was on fire, and we were we were trapped. Myself, my brother, who was I was seven, he would have been ten, right? And I remember we ran to the window, and of course all the smoke came flying into the sitting room, there, right? And we were trapped in that part, part of the house. There was nowhere else. Out. I remember opening a window and I found out a valuable lesson then that if you can, you can, you will, your better, better chance of dying of smoke inhalation, leaning out the window of your house during a house fire than you would if you were lying on the floor because all the air is, all the smoke is being sucked out. So there's right. no special air out the window. There's a huge kind of cloud. So I was trying to shout out the window for help, but I couldn't, couldn't breathe. The smoke was unbelievable, right? So next thing, thank God, some woman was walking by and saw us and shouted and two lads came and they fought because next thing i know someone was putting a wet j cloth over my face i was being lifted up and run out of the house right so fair fox of these two incredibly brave men ran into a burning fucking house and it was proper burn right 
ran into a burning house, saved our two lives, right? And then fucking dragged us out. And uh, house was destroyed, like completely gutted, like nothing left, like dust, right? And uh, we're pure luck now. We're blessed we were, we were saved. So we were moved. But my poor mother then, can you imagine coming home from work after? She had to leave the kids home alone. This was 1977, right? Yeah. Had to leave home alone. And uh, her, imagine coming back to find a fire brigade, your house burnt down, where the fuck are my kids? Imagine all that, right? So we moved to a new estate, a new housing estate, building up a side, which was Glengross Park in Moyross. And for the first couple of years, it was a lovely starter estate. Do you know what I mean? Nice, good McInerney built houses, blah, 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 blah. And then, of course, around about the early 80s, it just started, turned into a fucking war zone. And it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. Because so, Glendagross Park was the worst part of my Ross. It was insane. Like, you know, guys killing each other. And I had a guy type, well, I won't fill you with too many. My kids are always going, D -d Dad will have a story about something. I go, oh, I remember this. And then they'll be like, Jesus, how fucking, what did you, what sort of life did you have growing up? Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I go up my Ross till I was about 20 odd. And we were almost burnt out of that house as well. But that was fucking, I was, I was working with young people at the time. And I was trying to, my Ross had gotten so bad, I kind of, I contacted the cops and I contacted the government and I was basically allocated money to try and do something with the young people. But of course, the criminals at the time were using the young people as distractions. Suppose they were going to shoot somebody or rob somebody here. They'd get the young lads to set fire to something here and throw stones at the cops to distract the cops. So if I was getting the young lads off the road, this is going to be a problem. I was working in a homeless hostel at the time. And one night while I was at work, these guys knocked on the door of my ma's house. And when she opened the door, they, with a crowbar, they smashed every window in the car and said, tell your son to fucking just stop what he's doing, right? Aww. So the f two nights later, I, I obviously then, I, I didn't go to work that night. And two nights later, while I was asleep, I remember my, I was in the back of the house. My mother sort of just kicked in my, just pushed in my door and went, we didn't have a phone at the time. His phone's up, the phone was in the local shop. We run up to Helen and phone the fire brigade. They're after setting fire to the car and pushing it up against the front of the house, right? So I ran up, got the... Uh, I ran up, rang the fire brigade, and then came back. And I'll be honest, I probably lost it a bit then because I got. A, I used to always have, and I still to this day, I always have weapons all over the house. <laughs> but I had a kind of a, a pickaxe handle, right? And I went out and I fucking because I couldn't, I couldn't move the car back. But I was there with the pickaxe handle in the back garden, and the wind was blowing the flames onto the next door's house, and they had been kind of involved in this. Uh, so your man suddenly comes out trying to put out the fire, and I just went, get fucked swinging the fucking pickaxe at the man. <laughs> And I basically was like that until the guards came. And then the they fire were getting the guards. They put out the fire. They moved and blah, blah. So obviously we moved the following day. We left my Ross completely. But my poor mum had been buying that house, right? Actually buying. We're probably the only people in fucking Glen Ross Park who bought a fucking house. But she had to walk away and leave it. She only owed like three grand, but she didn't have the money. So we had to leave that house behind. So that was when we left my Ross. So yeah, there's there's just two of the two of the fun tales of growing up in my Ross. I went to college in Limerick in the IT. I remember there was... The and it was an Australian team were playing in Thoman Park. There was there were big shots. They were all fucking big names, like you know, all over the fucking team. George Greig and these people that were superstars, and a gang of lads from the local estate to Thoman Park, which you know where where that is. Well, uh, that broke into the, <laughs> it's right beside South Hill, like no, um, my Ross. I think it, yeah, my Ross, and they they broke in through the window and robbed. Oh, all of the Australian heads fucking stuff while they were out playing. playing the <laughs> That's fantastic. You know, Diana Ross and the Supremes were robbed in Limerick. What? Yeah, back in the 70s, they were playing the Two Mile Inn, which was a fancy hotel back in the day. And uh, they were robbed of something. Like, even back then, it was like 30,000 worth of jewellery. And Diana Ross refused to ever come back to Ireland because of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got robbed. Robbed in Limerick, and people were proud of that. That's the thing about like, I, like Limerick's an, is an insane place to grow up, and it's a very odd place because there's there's a lot there's lawlessness in certain parts, and it's spectacular lawlessness. And then there's the sweetest, nicest people you've ever met in your life, like genuinely good-hearted, kind people. And but there's always been that. I think if if this COVID thing turns into a zombie apocalypse, if you can get to Limerick, get to fucking Limerick because they'll protect. It'll be, they'll, they'll, they'll put a fucking wall around it and it'll be, you know, it'll be lawless, but it'll be cool. Do you know what I mean? Like, they'll look after you. Anyone who tries to break in is fucking Like, escape to LA. Because I do, because I still have a, an awful grow for Limerick. But what I found, it was, it was it, unbelievably polarizing in that where it was rough was rough, but where it was posh, 
fucking very posh, like. Yeah, like, unbelievably. A guy I grew up with, uh, I, he was, I went to school with, and I was mad. I had my 30-year school reunion there about six months ago. And he reminded me, because he came to visit my house, and I went to visit his. Now, my my house was in my Ross, right? And I remember, like, as I said, we didn't have much growing up. Like, my bedroom window, and he reminded me of this, and I didn't realize, my bedroom window in my room was broken for about a year and a half. And I'm talking the big window, like, just what? <laughs> And that's why, because I, I like, I jump in the sea in the mornings and I take cold showers. Like, I, I love the cold. And I, I'm always wearing shorts, even in the winter. I'm that dickhead. And I think it's because I grew up in the fucking cold, right? But he used to come to my house and it was just fucked, right? And my house was fucked. Right? And then I used to go and visit his house. And his house is on the original plans from the original Limerick Charter from, like, the, like, four, three or four hundred years ago. It's this astonishing old stately home that he used to live in. And talk about polar opposites, you're saying. He would come to visit me and broken windows and burnt out cars fucking everywhere. And then I'd go to visit him and they were literally the richest people I'd ever met in my life. Well, like the richest, the richest guy nearly in, well, definitely in Ireland is from County Limerickshire, J.P. McManus. Like he lives in a, the most ridiculous, ridiculous manner just outside the city. Because I met him last year. Now, he seems like a, a very down to earth man. But what uh, I, I, I briefly spoke to him about, he goes, how are you enjoying Limerick? I said, man, I, because he thought I was down with the panto and he thought I was, you know, he, he thought I was, had never been to Limerick before. Yeah, I, said, yeah. oh, is, I love this, but I was here for all, all my college years. And sure, I'm only from 30 miles out the road. Like, so this would have been our local shopping city. You know, my mother worked in Dell for 10 years. So we, there'd be a lot of ties in with Limerick. Like one thing I said to him, I said, you know what I noticed in all the places I gig all over the country, the customer service in Limerick. And I've said this, to fucking everybody and even like johnny ward who'd almost never been in limerick in his life he um he was the, the lead baddie and he was in dance with the stars and coppers the musical and stuff but he was and love hate when he said the exact same thing i said wait you see it when you go into the shops at the restaurants he's around i said there's a different they seem happy it's almost like an over eager it's almost like they put on that I'm not saying it's false, but you know when they're overly overly nice in North Korea when when people come, they go, hello, welcome. It's almost like that. It's like Limerick, it may be burning in certain spots behind us, but to mind them cunts, we're nice. That's the vibe I got like. But also there is a chance that whoever you're talking to might stick a Stanley knife in your head. So you know what I mean? <laughs> you've got to be fairly, you know, watching on. Like, I, remember, I remember once uh, eating, it was chicken fried rice with a portion of curry sauce and it was in, what was the name of the place? It was on William Street and it was a, a Thomas Street. It was just a Chinese right? takeaway, but you could sit in as well. And I remember getting my chicken fried rice, my portion of curry sauce, and finding a massive long hair, like fucking this long. Right? <laughs> and because uh, I, I had me sitting, I was with a mate of mine, and I said, uh, sorry. And she said, oh, terribly sorry, right? So she gets another one. And there was two hairs in the second one. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to her, and I was literally going to think, is she just fucking plucking them out of her head and dropping them in, right? And then she said to me, she went, uh, I saw, I went up to her a second, and then she said, for fuck's sake, would you not eat it? <laughs> and I went, this is true. And I went, do you know what? Fuck it, I will. And I just pulled him out and I ate the fucking thing. And it was crying. You know, but it was like, it was one of those, like, you wouldn't get that sort of service now. <laughs> it's like people would be shooting you. There still is that kind of vibe that it still feels local town vibe. You know, that kind of, and it was, it was, I didn't really cop it. It was Natasha that said it to me. And we went down, we went to, we said, we just we fucked off a couple of years ago on a Valentine's weekend. We went, well, I don't know where we'll go. We'll go somewhere. And we drove south and just kept, stayed on the M7. I went, do you want to stay in Limerick? She goes, I've never stayed in Limerick. So we, and I mean, it, it's, that it's. lucky girl, man. Valentine's and you take her to fucking Limerick. But here, here's, here's the thing. It was a fucking lovely weekend. We, Munster were playing that weekend in town. So there was a great buzz about the place. We went to Milk Market. We went out to, uh, out to watch McCall at Castle. So it was actually a cracking week. Bloody castles are made. You know, so like, I mean, you, you, you can tongue in cheek about it, but this, the place has a lot. But it was in, we went to, it was like a, a fucking healthy kind of burrito place for lunch. And your man was maybe, he brought out, he brought out Natasha's and then he for, he forgot, not that he forgot it, I don't know, but it, he didn't bring mine out. So I went back in because they were mad busy. I said, sorry, by any chance, he went, I am so sorry. Wooden charges for either one. Stop. Yeah. Jesus, yeah. that's pretty good. Yeah. And it was that, but that was the vibe throughout the day. You go down the milk market and you know you often go to fucking markets and often you nearly, maybe it's their lack of customer service or whatever, but there's almost a, you get a vibe nearly that you're you're annoying them by asking them, sorry, how much, could I, Absolutely. what is that? Yeah. 
this that was not it seemed to be on they all were on on point with the customers you know we it was it was almost non irish in how fucking good they were at selling shit you know what i mean it's almost american in the style like you know it's it's i i for me i fucking love going down to the place but i like i like when they when they get it right like I hate the falseness that you get in America that, hi, how are you? Have a nice day. Whereas, you know, in their head, they're going, you're a prick, right? And then there's the other side, which is the rest of Ireland, which is, what? But like, yeah. Kerry, has, Kerry has some of the worst, for a place that lives with tourists, some of the worst customer service. Just sit down and eat your food and fuck out, right? Whereas, yeah. it seems to manage just on that nice middle ground of, nice to have you here, we'll be very polite and lovely, but actually, we kind of mean it, which is great, you know? Well, I think that's what it is. They're thankful to have people, you know, that kind of way. Like when we go down with the with the panto, we're fucking superstars because they're going, you're bringing savage amount of custom in around the place. Like, there you like, go, yeah. 1,100 people twice a day out to the university for 18 days, you know what I mean? So it is, it does bring a lot of buzz in around the place. But tell me this, Not- when when did the comedy start? Did it start in Limerick or had you were you in oh. Dublin at that stage? I'll tell you, the mad how the comedy started because, as I said, I was working with young offenders. Uh, I used to work when I, I was a huge comedy fan, I used to work at a children's home in London and I used to get one day, you lived in, right? And I used to get one day off uh, a week, one night off. And on a Wednesday night was my Wednesday was my day, day off. And in the in Chiswick, there was a comedy club just in a regular little bar. And I got to see people like before they were famous. I got to see Harry Hill, got to see Al Murray, all these guys when they were on the way up. And literally long, like when they were, say, two or three years in, like I'm not talking, you know, just about to launch on television. So I got to see some great ones. And I used to sit there looking at it. And I'd be sitting on my own, because I, I didn't have anybody over there, and in the front row, almost hoping to be picked on. And if someone did, I'd usually fucking zing them quite well back, right? Yeah. And, and then uh, I met Newell over there as my wife. And uh, she knew how mad I was about comedy. I think it was one of the first dates I ever took her on. I took her to the comedy store in Leicester Square. And then we got home to Ireland. And I was working in the assessment room, unit in Finglas. And it was Newell's birthday night. And we went out. And we went out for dinner. And we were walking past the Haypenny on a Tuesday, it was a Tuesday night. Went in, the Battle of the Axe was on. And Nuala said, look, if you really want to give me a present, just go up and do it, right? Okay. And I'm thinking of whatever I just bought her. I'm kind of going, that was a fucking present. <laughs> but anyway, so I walked over. It was Tony Ferns. I didn't know him at the time. I walked over. I said, uh, can I go on? He said, you're on after the next guy. And of course, I had nothing planned, nothing, whatever, right? So I got up and I did five minutes to complete fucking silence, right? I could hear them blinking at me. And then I got off stage and I said to Newell, I went, I can do this. I bet I can do it. I fuck, I'm going. And then I came back an event and I was worse than the first time. I was even more shy with prepared material. But, you know, you know, we're like, we just keep going and we just keep at it. And for about, I refused to go anywhere near the international or anything else, right, for like two years. Because I knew I wasn't good enough to kind of leave the, the open mic scene. Yeah, a load of guys try and leave too soon. And I knew I wasn't ready. So I said, I'll go. with. So when Leon, my eldest boy, was born. Uh, he was born in 2003. Uh, sorry, yeah, in 2003 in September. And Nuala's uh, maternity leave was up in January. So I said I'd take a year's career break because I had the permanent pension of a government job. I'd take a year's career break to look after him uh, for his first year at least and be the daddy and then give the comedy a push because I was still doing the open mic set. And then, thank God, stuck with it. The open mic, I, I started getting a bit legs on it. And after a year... I was doing okay, and now not. I certainly wasn't making money, but you know, there was light at the end of the tunnel, and I'd loved looking after Leon. So we said, "Fuck it, just give it up, give it to go." So I chucked in everything, and uh, you know, it's been years. Like I've been, I do a load of other jobs. Like I've, you know, I've a book published, I've written for magazines and newspapers, I do all sorts of event work, corporate quizzes. I have this thing now. So like, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't have made fortunes out of um, out of stand up. But yeah, if it wasn't for Leon being born, I would never have. Uh, Given it the big push, I'd probably still work on my own offense. I probably would have killed one winner. <laughs> I was doing it for years, right? My joy is whenever I met a woman in the laughter lounge only three or four weeks ago, before this whole lockdown came, my last gig in the laughter lounge, uh, this woman came up and hugged me. I, I recognized her. I used to work with her back in the day. She now still works in that field. And I was saying to her, I said, the greatest joy is now if I meet a young offender, I can kick the fuck out of. Like it's like it's I can I, I can happily punch him in the head knowing that I'm probably not going to I'll never be working with him. I did a gig in, in Mountjoy prison there, uh, not the Mountjoy gig in Wheatfield a few years back. Right. And I remember my hair was long at the time. I walked out. Hadn't said it was me and Dave McSavage, just the two of us. Right. I walked out and because uh, I was starting it off, as you imagine. And I had, before I'd even said a word, some guy went, 
fuck off, you long hair prick, right? And I went, how long, how long you been in here for, boy? And he goes, eight and a half years. I went, eight and a half years? I must look like Britney fucking Spears right now, dude, right? <laughs> Whole place erupted. And I turned around, and I did that kind of cheeky look back, showing my arse. I went, use that image in your cell any, any way you want, right? And, of course, I was riding high at this stage. I went, hey, it's all ready to go, right? And then I said, was anyone here ever in, in the remand and assessment unit in Finglas? This lad sticks up his hand, and I recognized him. I could tell you his name. I won't, right? And I just went, I said, do you remember years ago when I said, if you don't cop the fuck on, you'll end up in jail? Well, here you go. <laughs> it was a beautiful moment of finally I told you so. But, um, but yeah, so the thing is, I love that I don't. like Because working with you, I, I was good at it. I mean, really good at it. I've been doing it since I was about 16. And I wouldn't take any shit from the lads, but I always treated them with respect and I always looked after them and I kept them safe. And they knew it. Like I had a guy come up to me there, uh, just walked up to me randomly in a pub and he goes, do you remember me? This is a couple of years ago. And a huge guy built like a brick shit house with MMA t-shirt on and muscles upon muscles upon muscles. Massive. And he told me who he was. And I remembered him. He was a very disturbed, very damaged young lad, right? And no one could really handle him or control him. And I just seemed to click with him, right? From the yeah. moment I met him. I met him, he was sitting stark naked. He'd removed every stitch of clothes. And he was sitting there starting because he knew. And the two things you, you instantly tell you from that. One is how damaged is a young man that he's, as, as a teenager, is willing to sit there naked in front of strangers. Shows that he's totally disassociated from his body. It's a real sign of abuse, right? And the other thing was um, just, he'd only just been sent on Romantos and he was going to fuck the world, blah, blah, blah. So nobody could handle, nobody could kind of, he was just isolated from the others. He was just in a room sitting down naked. So I walked in sat down across him, started chanting. Within about a minute and a half, I went, do will you do me a favour? And he went, what? Well, I said, would you close your legs? I can see right up your arse. <laughs> he <laughs> burst out laughing. I had him dressed within five minutes. And after that, he used to do anything I want. You know, and he was a good lad. and He, would, he, he wasn't a good lad. He was nuts. Right? But he ended up, um, uh, I think, at a house party. He woke up, someone was after shaving off one of his eyebrows, and he stabbed him, and he ended up going to jail and all that, right? And then he was a heroin addict for years. And then he came out, sorted his life out, and then started MMA, and now he's gigantic. But he was saying to me that, you know, the redress board for people who are abused and care and stuff and blah, blah, blah. He said, I mentioned you. He said to me, up there in the pub, he said, I mentioned you uh, in my report to the redress board. I wrote about you. Uh, and I'm like, oh, hold on now, kid. I would remember. <laughs> but he went, he said, no, he said, I've lifted with you as one of the few people who in care really treated me well and treated me decently and blah, blah, blah. And he went off to get something. He came back up to me, and I didn't thought while he was away. And I said, hey, dude, I said, do you know, can I say something? He went, what? I said, looking at the size of you now, I'm really fucking glad I was nice to you back in the day. Because this guy would have ripped my arms and legs off. You know what I mean? But that's the point. I was really good at it. But when you're working with that level of violence and that level of damage, you know, young people and all that, really damaged. And some of them, some of them, by the way, just habitual criminals, you go, someone should shoot this kid because he's never going to fucking change. Others, right. you know, you could but loads you couldn't. And it got to a stage where just at the right time that my eldest was born and I was able to take this career break because I think I was genuinely getting burnt out. Because if you're good at it and you give a shit, you, do, you start taking on a lot. And I found I was thinking of these lads' victims. For the first time, I was thinking of their victims more than thinking of them. And that's not what you should be doing if you're walking with them. Do you know what I mean? I was going, yeah. why, why am I trying to get this guy a weekend leave home when he's going to terrorize all the decent people who live near him? Do you know what I mean? And I shouldn't have been thinking that way. So thankfully, kid was born, comedy took off, and now, as I said, I can punch a juvenile offender any time. Because I was going to ask like about weird gigs and all the rest of it, but fucking hell, Wheatfield Prison is a good old fucking start. <laughs> sure, uh, we were only in Mount Joy there about four or five months ago. Myself, Adam Burke, Pat Murray, and Joe Dowling, right? And it was oh, mad. We, we walked into a room with 80 lads, right? sitting on what I can only describe as throwable fucking chairs. Right? And, we were all, <laughs> and they literally, we walked in the door and we're at the doorway and they're all sitting around a big kind of a semicircle. And as soon as we walk in, you can see them going, who the fuck are these cunts? You can hear them. Do you know who are these pricks and blah, blah, blah. And I went, fuck this. I am not going to be walking in here with my tail between my legs for you cunts, right? I'm not going to have ye in control. I'm not going to sweat the ball. Because I was nervous as hell about the gig. You know me, I don't get nervous at gigs. But this yeah. is fucking lads locked in and they, you know, They'd, and I wasn't, I wasn't, if there was a riot, I'm telling you now, I was taking the biggest one and I was going to, I was going to hell biting on his ear. <laughs> but I, I said, fuck this. I walked straight into the room. The lads, we were all congregated at the door and I went, fuck this. I walked right in and I sat down in amongst all of them. And I just turned around and said, the fucking bang of weed off you. Jesus Christ, best prison ever. Right? 
And straight away they were going, it's an alpha dog. You know what I mean? I wasn't coming in all wimpy. And then I will say this, Adam Burke, he was he hosted it. He came out uh, like a, a shotgun blast. He was fucking amazed. And I was closing the fucking thing, right? So Joe Dowling came out first, did great. Then I had to follow Patser. And you know Patser, he's a proper scumbag. You know? yep. <laughs> Patser and Joe. And so I was a bit nervy about finishing, but it was great because I just started, you know what I did? I started slagging them one after the other, just going around the room. And one was great because one guy, I said, look at the fucking guard ahead in this fella. Turned out he's one of the teachers in the in the education block. And he <laughs> couldn't look more like a guard if he had fucking I Love Temple more tattooed across his head, right? And he was absolutely, he said, he was saying to me afterwards, he said, why the fuck did you say the guard? He's one of the teachers in the block. He said, all they say to me is I'm undercover. Every time they see me go, fucking undercover, you can tell by looking at you. And then a total stranger comes in. But uh, yeah, mad gigs are mad gigs. I mean, I mean, I'm not, I don't believe in getting scared of gigs because, you know, at the end of the day, what's the worst that's going to fucking happen to you? People aren't going to laugh. I've had enough laugh. When you've been doing it long enough and you know you're funny, like, you know, because like, like the one thing I always said is really weird. There's a moment for every comedian. I wonder if you, did you experience this? Where, you know, one day you walk into a green room or you, you show up at a festival or at some gig and no one in the room is surprised to see you. Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. all the other comics are like, all right, Tom, how are you doing? Do you know, it's like you're accepted. You're meant to be there. No one's kind of going, geez, how did they get that gig? Or, oh, look at you fucking playing for big boys. And that moment, and it's so weird. You don't even, it's only afterwards you kind of think about it and go, yeah, I fucking made it now. And once you have, once you know, when you've had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of gigs under your belt and you've made people laugh in all different ways, any one gig doesn't matter shit. You know what I mean? Because it's it might be you, it might be you're not informed, it might be the audience, it might be somebody playing music downstairs, fuck the atmosphere or whatever. But at least I know I'm funny now, so I don't get scared. Anymore. It was something similar to that. I remember one night walking away. It was in, it was in the laughter lounge. And I was only, it was, I was filling in because um, Peter texted me that morning and he said, come here, you're not around town tonight gigging, are you? I said, I'm not, but I'm, I'm at a wedding just over, it was a small wedding in, is it Fallon and Burn? You know, it's on, it's beside the international there. They have a little function room up, upstairs. And Amazing said, food. Well, great food. I said, Do you know what? That'll give me a great excuse to stay sober. So I'm in the full, full wedding suit, like tweed wedding suit, the whole lot. Nice. And I was just great. I, and it was grand because everybody else was kind of getting locked and I was just simmering nicely. I said, I'm just going to pop away and do a gig. And the lounge was packed like I've never, ever seen it packed before. Like you couldn't have crowbarred in a fucking fish, let alone another person. And the heat, and, it's an amazing, it's an amazing room. Oh, like it was, it was buzzing. You could have stood there with your finger up your nose, you know, that kind of way. And people would have roared laughing. And I went down and basically told them what the crack was, that I was after popping over in the middle of a wedding. And it just felt like, do you know what that, those moments, those, I suppose they call it the flow state, don't they? Where you yeah. don't even think about what you're going to say next, but you're, you're ripping down the road in sixth gear and everybody's in the car with you. You know what I mean? And just, mm -hmm. I don't know what time I did. I don't know anything, but just walk back, mic in the stand, good luck and thanks, jacket back on and back to the wedding. And it was only the next day I was like, herself, I said, how was the, the gig last night? I went, it was, it was actually perfect. It yeah. was perfect. It's also cool to go back to the wedding going, like, have a say, listen, I've got to run and do a gig. Especially, you know, now everyone knows she's a comic. But when you know when you're first starting out, and not really first starting, for the first few years, you're kind of, you know, you're unsure. Like, I, I, you, I find young ones come up to me now. If they have any sense, they'll come up and ask advice. I've always find, if you always ask advice of other comics, because ones have been doing it a while, no shit. Like, people will ask me advice about emceeing, and they're right to it, because I know what I'm talking about. It translates easy enough because you you did um because I had Alan Quinlan you met Alan Quinlan the the, the Heineken thing uh, yeah you, remember Salmon. You, you jumped on and he says he was actually asking for you. he says um he he was great I said but that's Steve I said MC and you, you could put that man MC in a funeral and he'd be fucking grand like but it translates straight over from doing from doing stand up you were outdoors in a fucking pub in League Slip that day were you yes but you know what was gas about that. Well, that was the day they fucking he fucking kicked a he kicked a rugby ball over the pub, which was a fucking cool move. If nothing else, right? At the end of it, but he was sound. But the thing is, I I think my MCing comes from working with young offenders for years. I used to be standing in front of like thirty of them and going, "Okay, I'm cancelling the fucking day the trip out today because you guys have been acting the bollocks." And then you could imagine there's a hostile audience for you. So the thing is, I've never really gotten freaked out by the audience. So and I'm because. I think I've always found that every penny I've ever earned from comedy or anything connected to it, I always feel, geez, I'm lucky to get that fucking money. Do you know what I mean? Because like, yeah. I, 
I always feel I'm winging it most of the time. And it's like, Jesus Christ, I just got paid whatever to do that shite. You know, so, so like, I'll turn my hand to anything for money. I mean, and obviously, like, my wife, uh, she's the, the main breadwinner, thank God. But I've been trying to earn money. And for the last 16 years, working out whatever someone asked me to do for, for this event, for Lidl, right? And it is Lidl, as they correct my pronunciation. I did about 10 videos for them, right? Viral, attempted viral videos. And in those different videos, I was a Zumba dance instructor. They were always trying to make them funny. I was a game show host. I've been a priest. I've been Elvis, right? And when I was booked for fucking Elvis, they had full costume the whole nine yards, right? I went, okay, but you're booking me. You're getting mid-70s Elvis. You're not getting, you know, 1964 Elvis. You're getting <laughs> one fucking cheeseburger away from shit and stuff to death Elvis, right? And I arrived, I put on this fucking outfit. And it was two, twice with the legal thing. Once was that, and once was with the Zumba outfit. It seemed like, did you ever see f- flat pack or vacuum packed fucking chestnuts? That was <laughs> basically my crush. This thing was bet on to me. And you could, and it was like, it just, you could literally, like, you could hear it kind of, like it molded to everything. You could see where, you could see hair and everything, right? And I remember <laughs> I, was in, I was in Cork being the Zumba thing, and I, put, I went downstairs to the toilet to put this on, right? Put on this fucking tracksuit. It was like a shell suit I had to wear because it was all done ironically that a wig on me. And the next thing, it just went all over my crotch. And I, I had no underwear, right? I had to go up to TK Maxx dressed like that with holding my bag in front of my crotch, buy a pair of underpants, then go into, buy them in TK Maxx, then go and say, do you mind if I put these on in your changing room? You're once looking at me going, clearly this man has shat his pants unexpectedly. <laughs> <laughs> off them at all, right? And then go down and do me some bit. But the Elvis costume, which was, this was on South Ann Street in Dublin, right? Performing fake weddings at a fucking pop-up wedding chapel. Uh, I, I'd know, nowhere to hide my, my, my flat pack or my backpack. So basically, I, on a cold fucking day in, in Dublin, on a windy street, I'm on a, wearing a skin-tight fucking Elvis costume with my not no. impressive manhood fucking sucked in there. So the thing is, I'll, I've done, I'll do any shit for money. I still will. I still, and that's why weird opportunities come to you. Now, in the eyes of the government, I own a transport company because of this bus, this comedy bus. I literally, like, I had to go through hoops with the Department of Transport. And now, if you look me up, if the government look up a database, they go transport company owners. Uh, they'd be, what, name the different major ones, like Lucy and fucking whoever else. And then, or Hen- Menigan or De- Denigans. And then Steve Cummins, yeah, he owns his own transport company. I own half a fucking double-decker bus. So then. <laughs> Well, how did the, because that, that was what I wanted to get on to, the, the double-decker bus. How did that even pop into your head? I remember you telling me about it in the green room one day in, in uh, the laughter lounge. And I was like, that's a fucking great idea. It, so what's it, the... It fell on my lap. Peter, Peter Manny owns laughter lounge, right? He got a phone call from these, this company called Hidden Dublin, and they own, like, the ghost bus and the 1916 bus and all these bus tours. And they want to do stand-up comedy on a bus, right? So we met up, right? Peter said, would I come and meet with these guys, right, with him? So we're to meet in this hotel off the Kyle Moore Road. And I swear to God, it looks like the sort of place where the Kinnahans fucking plan their hits, right? This grim fucking hotel, obviously built during the Tiger, horrible thing. So we arrive in there. Next thing, this bus arrives. And it was a double-decker bus, jet black, right? This is a comedy bus. As I, I rang Peter, because he was driving, and I went, uh, he was on his way. I said, you won't be able to miss it. The bus looks like the sort of thing they used to use to ferry Jews to Auschwitz. <laughs> The most horrible looking fucking. You're thinking, how are you supposed to be funny on this, you fuck, right? So we get on. I was so they arrived. So we get on this bus, and downstairs was done for the Hellfire Club. So there was like, you know, the Hellfire Club that up in Tala there, and the story is that the devil was playing cards, and they have a card table and the hooves under it and beds. It was the weirdest thing downstairs. And then upstairs, the, the back seats are up as far as say where the, the the stairs are. All the back seats are facing front, but then the front say eight seats are facing back, and there's a little stage. So they said, we want to do stand-up comedy on this bus. So we told them it was going to cost a fair fucking amount of money if you wanted like, to do an actual comedy club, have three acts and all that and that and that. They couldn't afford it, not with the overheads. So said, thanks, but no thanks. They bought us lunch. We drove away. I headed off. And I was driving on the M50, and I went, you know, I can see you yawn. Just saying, we're doing this over Skype. So it's like, I love what I'm telling the story. Six-month-old baby. Six-month-old baby. Oh, I know. I've given it. All right. It's funny, though. But uh, it's like it's like every audience I've ever had. But, um, <laughs> uh, long story born, I was driving home and I went, there has to be a way of making money out of this. Right? I have to come up with something. 
And so I thought, fuck it. I pulled into a Tesco car park and I rang your man because he gave me his card. And I said, how about I come up with a sightseeing tour of Dublin and make it funny. I'll be the only guy on it. You have your driver, obviously, and I'll be the guy upstairs and I'll write a route and I'll come up, I'll come up with a, a plan of route, come up with a script. We'll do that. So he said, all right, let's go for it. It'd be considerably cheaper. And I thought it'd be a way of making me some cash, right? So I planned a route. I did a load of research, all sorts of like the GPO and the Garden of Remembrance and Trinity and all this stuff, right? And we got a load of invited guests on. We drove around and it was shite beyond measure. Like just, it was grip. We hit two sets of green lights going past the GPO and everything I had about the GPO was pointless. Just fucking gone. <laughs> Sorry, boy. So like, fuck me. It was just horrid, right? So I went, fuck, I better get back to the drawing board. And I had two genius ideas, one after the other, it, literally within minutes. And the first genius idea was, you know, pub jokes, man walks into a bar, blah, 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 good long jokes. I came up with about 30 of those that I think are funny. And I put them on cards, right? So one word, if you so say, nasal sex, you've heard me tell that joke, right? And that, and different, so you, I'd walk up to you, there's red cards, green cards, and orange cards. And I'm, each card's a word associated with jokes. So I walk to you, what's your name? Tom, how are you, Tom? We've been, this is for boring parts of the ball. When there's nothing interesting to talk about out the window. What's your name? Tom, what do you do? Oh, Tom, great. Blah, blah, blah. Pick a card. If you pick a green card, it's a squeaky clean joke. An orange card's 50-50. A red card's filthy as fuck. We need a lot of red cards. And that's so for those boring moments, I'll tell those jokes, which go down a tree, because they're good jokes, right? And the second genius idea, which came straight on after the other, which was BYOB, bring your own booze on, right? When's the last time you were drinking on the top deck of a double-decker bus? You were probably like 15, right? Yeah. Although no one knew from the country, you were probably doing it in a tree, right? But it's um, it's amazing buzz. People get on the bus. Like, people get on with tons of drink. I mean, tons. Every man will come on with eight cans. It's an hour-long tour. That's a can every six, six and a half minutes. What's great is a lot of times people are heading out for dinner, and they leave you drink. I remember I walked home with a crate now, right? Walked back to the car with a crate and a half of, a box and a half of Corona and 14 cans of Heineken. And that's because I'd split it up with the, with the driver. I always share everything with the driver, right? Uh, one perfect moment of the drink, people are so great in Ireland, right? There was, to my left, there was two women, clearly from Dalky, right? They had a bottle of Veuve Clicquot champagne and two actual crystal fucking champagne flutes, right? Sitting directly across from two women from, I'm guessing, Bally Furman, right? Because that's always the punchline of most of my jokes, right? From Ballier, they had a bottle of Blossom Hill, right? And they had two cardboard Costa coffee cups that they were after nicking from Costa or so on the road. And, they're, and they both had an amazing time, right? And the final thing on that drink thing is, and it was a beautiful moment as well, there was an English couple on the bus there a few months ago, and everybody's drinking away. And I looked and I said, are you guys not drinking? And they said, oh, we didn't know we could bring drink. And I was, oh, that sucks. Within 20 seconds, some guy went, here, can, can for your man and a can of gin and tonic for the woman. That's for them. And then somebody else showed it. When you're finished those, just let us know and I'll get you one. And basically, that's, those English people flew, flew back home to England going, the Irish are the nicest fucking people in the world. Do you know what I mean? We're like, ah, we're all drinking here. Have a drink. So anyway, to finish off the story of it, that's how it started to work. And then, but they weren't really selling it. You know, they, it should have been. Like, it's such a good idea. It should have been rammed. So would you believe one of the guys came to me and said, actually, I own that concept. I will gift you half the company if you'll take it over and run it and make it something big and special. And I went... I, I went to my accountant and I went, am I exposed here? Am I going to lose my fucking house? And he went, no, you're not. It's a limited company. You're fine. So basically I took it on and I'm running it and I'm going down the corporate route there. I'm getting it rewrapped and all that. I've got a, I have a graphic designer in the Philippines working on a, on, a, on a wrap for the bus for me, right? First of all, he went out of contact for about four weeks because of a fucking volcano. I thought he was dead, right? Eventually he gets, because there was no Wi-Fi on the island. He couldn't contact me. So then he gets back to me going, I'm just after cleaning all the ash off my house. <laughs> and I went, great, you're alive. Here, fucking keep working, right? Because, you know, I don't give a shit. Keep, keep, keep doing it. Next thing, COVID hits. The Philippines, apparently, there's shoot to kill martial law on the streets if you're out after curfew. So uh, I sent him an email there yesterday going, would you please hurry up? And he's like, fucking I don't care if you get killed. No, I didn't. I can't push the guy now. But, uh, yeah, so that's my story. So please, God, when all this ends, because I obviously there's going to be a big hold back. We're going to hit another recession and everything else. But I think that a lot of these companies, some of the big companies still have money and they will still be looking to organize things for their staff. And I hopefully I'm going to be ready to launch it at the perfect time when people are looking for stuff. And um, I'm hoping to sell the company in five years for 50 million and relax. What's it called? It's comedybus.ie. Just comedybus.ie. Comedybus.com exists. 
but the cunts who own it want two thousand fucking dollars for the uh, for the right. domain rights. The bastards, and, and they don't have it. They just they just bought up the domain of loads of different things: comedy tree, comedy house, comedy whatever. So my 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 business partner, he got on to me because he because he'd gone looking for it. I didn't really care. I thought okay, what Dottie will do. It'd be nice to have dot com, but it'll do. So they sent him an email back going, yes, that domain is available. It is $1,995. And I said, follow me on the email. I'll contact him. And I literally just sent back a one line, go fuck yourself. I was like, you horrible little fuckers trying to make money out of nothing. Go and shit. I, I hope that they are stuck with that domain name for the rest of it. However, I still every month check just in case they lapse by mistake. And I'll be in like fucking Cobra. And then I'll email them from my new fucking comedybus.com website. And there's no limits to that either. I mean, technically, you could put one in each in each of the major cities. Like, you know what I mean? I would wonder how big. See, because the way I'm looking at because I'm going to do I'm going to do other little things as well. Because corporate transport, I did a thing just before um, just there to, before this really hit, and it was 16 lawyers for uh, service now. They're a big company, right? And there were 16 lawyers from all over the world: Russia, Italy, France, Spain, basically. A COVID hotspot, right? but they came, they were over for a meeting and you won. I booked, you wanted books, the, the, the HR person booked with me. Their meeting finished at three o'clock. None of them knew each other. I collected them at their company and they had boxes of fucking gin and tonic and bottles of beer and Heineken and blah, blah, blah. Onto the bus, drove them around for an hour and a half, telling them jokes, showing them the sights of the city, let them have a few drinks and then dropped them all off at their hotel, which in Balls Bridge. And then that night then they were all out to dinner, blah, blah, blah. And you won't contact me the next morning. And she said, I've never seen it happen. She said, these are a group who nobody knew each other. By the time they got off your bus, they were in great form. They were all friends. They all knew each other. So that dinner out we had that night was the best corporate dinner we've ever had in the history. Of the because people were, they just got to know each other. And you imagine, and you know me, I'm all like, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm funny and stupidly funny. And it's all a bit of crack and it's all, I'll slag somebody off, but I'll never hurt them. You know what I mean? I'm always, yeah. I'm, so it's like, there was a lot of gentle chiding going on and a lot of jokes. And by the end of it, they all knew each other really well. So I think corporately it could make a fortune. That's the fingers crossed. Now. Well, you can't go wrong anyway. As you said, it's a limited company. So fucking all in. Company. Worst, that'll, worst that'll happen is I lose a lot of time. Like I haven't taken a salary from the company yet and I've been busting my ass to and stuff. You know what I mean? Traveling all over. But please God, if it works out, then I say to make some money of it. Well, the amount of people that message me, because a lot of people listen to this abroad and stuff like that, or outside of the greater Dublin area, and they go, what do we do? And I normally go, uh, if, if you're on a stag or something or whatever, fucking, I don't know, I normally send them to a comedy club, whether it be the lounge or something like that, and they do, they tend to go. But this is a great idea, too, for if maybe 12 girls or 12 guys or, you know, a gang of people are coming. Ten go. stags are great, because I, I do because it's, it's available for private hire as well. So what I do, what I had loss of, is like a hen group. And I'll collect them, say, say, um, what's that? The Dean Hotel there. Sophie's the Dean Hotel. And I've had quite a few where they're eating there. Their meal finishes about 7.30. They come out. Our bus is right outside the door. They climb on. There's booze on the bus. And then we either do bingo. We do funny bingo stuff. We do the jokes. We do whatever. And we're, br we're bringing them to their next destination, right? So it's a fucking no-brainer. So instead of a load of women staggering through town, they get driven through town. They can still keep drinking, still having the crack. And then, and I, and I, I've always been with the hen group. I always really build them up. I think that because it's a very special night for women, you know what I mean. So I really do want to make it special. So it's like uh, if they book me, I, I, I will pre-interview whoever booked me to get me a load of information about the hen and about their friends and whatever. So it becomes a real tailor-made kind of experience for them, and it's cheap. Like it's about twenty quid a ticket, which is if you think if they all had to jump into taxis, they'd be paying fucking probably nearly a fucking seven or eight, ten quid ahead, depending on where they're going. And with this, they have the crack and what have you. I know it's Steve at comedyboss.ie. If someone's listening, there they go. They can fucking book it. But it's good crack. And I mean, as I said, it's uh, it's basically going to help me to retire. So please. Great. I'll put it in the show notes down the bottom of this anyway, so people can click through and have an old fucking gander. Um, other than that, Steve, where do people follow you? Find me on Facebook. I don't do Twitter because I feel Twitter is like, you know, throwing right. hits in the air. I mean, there's some... There's a million robots watching you, but that's it. Instagram, I have one Instagram picture. It's me and uh, Joe and Murr from Impractical Jokers in the green room of the Laugh Lounge. When I was working with Joe there last year or the year before, and he's if you, are you, did you ever watch Impractical Joke? Yeah. Joe, you know Joe, the nice fella. He comes across and he is just as nice in real life, and Murray is just like Murray in real life. 
He's a real professional, but you can tell he's the business brain of a lot of them. But it was just the two of them in, and they were the sound as fuck. They, Joe was doing a bit, just 10 minutes. He never does stand-up. So he did like 10 minutes on stage. He was supporting a guy who does support who does support for them in America. Um, but after the show, they stayed around, Joe and Moore, and they took a photograph and signed autographs with every single, it's like 300 people in the room. Uh, and it wasn't, on, it wasn't on them to do it. They just did it. That's part of the reason they're so successful. Sound like so thank you for the following uh, reference. Book onto my boss. I don't give a shit about people listening. <laughs> my Facebook is just me share, sharing weird memes. If you want to follow me on WhatsApp, you know, <laughs> you know my WhatsApp, Tom. Oh, no. I'm not even getting into it. I'm not even getting it. Oh, my good Jesus. Although I've a WhatsApp game of every group I'm involved in has just... Like way too much penis. Way too much penis in my life right now. The amount of unexpected tranny porn is just... It's like, it's got to a stage now. I don't trust a real woman anymore. I'm expecting her. <laughs> just rip her massive willy out and spin it in front of me. And it's the same. If I hear anything, if anyone starts speaking quietly, I'm waiting to hear that. Ah, ah. <laughs> it's, oh. it's so funny. Like this, I People have PTSD from being on my WhatsApp group. Newell is, you know Rory Campbell? Yeah. Rory the comic. Rory's out in Kuwait, right? And he's living on a military base in Kuwait. And one day I sent him this one. And it's this girl telling a story, right? And next thing, and it ends, it just before the story ends, it, that loud, sexy noise, the, the woman orgasm and noise comes on. He sent me a recording. If I thought of it, I'd play it for you now. I, I would have had it ready to play it. And it's basically him going, he's literally going, you fucking prick. <laughs> he just recorded his own voice. He says, I was in the canteen. He said, I was surrounded by soldiers. He said, there was a colonel and a captain with me. The colonel was a woman. Right? He said, it was really nice. So I had to turn up the sound really loud. And then this fucking noise went off. Phone flew out of his hand. He couldn't reach it on time. People are looking at him like he was a disgusting pervert. Uh, I, I put, what was so funny was he was so annoyed, but he was laughing while telling me it was great. That was a proud moment for a dickhead, really. <laughs> Steve Commons, thank you very, very much. Later, Tommy. Thanks, brother. Thanks a million, Steve. Like you said, get over, have a look at comedybus.ie. I'll post the link in the show notes down the bottom. And guests and Spotify will obviously mash the whole fucking lot together, but it's pretty simple. Comedybus.ie. It's going to be a good day out. I'm going to give it a crack myself, just so I can get drunk in public, basically. Do you know? Why not? Don't forget to rate and review. And give me them five stars. Give me them juicy, juicy five stars, lads, because we've way more five stars than a lot of a lot of podcasts out there. Just because of you, fantastic people, give it the five stars. It gets it up the charts for meaning that more people can make see it and make it more visible for everybody else. Hence, bringing more listeners on board. Keep the messages coming. Jesus, I've been getting some amount of messages. I fucking love it. People where they're listening to the podcast, thanking me fucking just a mundane shit that's going on and all the rest of it. Just giving me basically a tangible fucking set of ears to know that I'm actually talking to people. Send me on an old snap. If you're out the back sunning yourself, let me know. Let me know what's going on. Right, gang. Go on away. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Stuff your heads with chocolate. And I'll talk to you again next Tuesday. Harden Up Podcast out tomorrow, Friday the 10th, just in case you're wondering. <laughs>